Hi, everybody. My name is Patrick Polischuk, and I joined Crossref earliest, earlier this year. Um, I have the pleasure of announcing the next few speakers. Um, our next speaker is Paul Delug from the American Physical Society. His talk is called Crossref Sucks and How to Cope, which I think is very mean. Um, but I talked to Paul, and I know he means the best, and we do welcome this kind of criticism because it helps us be better. And I know that tough love is still love, so let's see where this goes. Paul? <laughs> Cool. Thanks, Patrick. So yeah, I think it says a lot about Crossref that they, uh, they let me keep the title and they invited me to actually speak on the topic. And, and it does come from a place of love. It's like Crossref is that family member that's just got a few issues. You have to sit them down and have a, a little chat with them, right? Uh, supposed to use this to go forward? Cool. So just a small warning of what lies ahead, but just to set expectations, you know, on the scale of like, it totally sucks to it doesn't suck, Crossref is at like, you know, a little bit to moderate amount of suckage. So I don't think we're talking about anything really major. And a lot of it is really just things that have grown over time. And it's time to kind of take a step back and rationalize a few things. Uh, so I'm, I'm on the publisher side. We're a society publisher. We publish uh, primarily physics journals. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is uh, things that come from that experience. So you, you may have different things that suck, or maybe Crossref works great for you. I'd be surprised, but it, it's possible. Uh, <laughs> so like I said, it's time to have a little talk. So we've been talking a lot uh, about the conference so far about metadata and having quality metadata. And that, that's great. But really, Crossref is about a lot more than just the actual metadata. It's about the services that are around it. Uh, because without those, it's really not useful to have metadata. Uh, we really need to have, you know, something to do with the metadata. So first, we've got to get the data in, right? So of course, you're all depositing it somehow. So you've seen uh, this great slide of the, the perfect set of metadata. And it's, it's getting close to perfect. But maybe what's not perfect is the schema that it's in. So if we take a really close look at, at those elements, uh, we'll see a lot of inconsistencies and a lot of oddities and, and those things in there. So we look at licenses, and that's sensible enough. Don't know why it's called a program. Don't know why one's free to read and one is a license ref. And OK, well, that's fine. Uh, then we'll get to clinical trials. And now we've got you know, another namespace. Uh, this one uses XML tags that have dashes instead of underscores. So you know, it's just it works, but it's, it's ever so slightly inconsistent. Or I, I guess it works. I don't know. I've never seen one of these in the wild. Uh, so funding data, too. It's, it's pretty easy. You just add some XML. We all love XML. We're in Scully industry, it's, it's kind of the thing. Uh, just add this stuff, it's great. Except if you're using Crossmark, then you need to know it needs to be embedded in some Crossmark thing, which you don't find out until later. Speaking of Crossmark, yeah, it works, kind of works. But, you know, we deposited this beautiful data. Where'd the title, where'd the uh, publication date go? It's gone. Uh, you notice the same thing on the slides Chuck presented yesterday, uh, because Crossmark doesn't show online publication dates, so, okay, it's gone. Uh, also says updates are available. Well, that, that's really interesting because, you know, we, we did update the article. We have data back here saying we did update it with a date. We clicked the link on the PDF with the date, but it, it still says updates available. So the users are very confused. Crossref says in situ corrections are not supported, meaning we didn't publish another article to correct that article. We just corrected it. <laughs> but we did cross mark to not do that because we wanted to do core agenda that would do this. So kind of sucks, doesn't really work very well uh, for that use case. Well, deposits, you know, we could go through even more of the XML, the relations are a little different, everything's a little different, um, but at least it's easy to troubleshoot them. Well, not really, because you get back these cryptic error messages, and uh, we discover, for some reason, given names can only have 35 characters. Uh, this guy really loves his long name, though, it's 37 characters long. Why can't he have a longer name? I don't know. But, you know, it's a mystery that appears one day, and you get this great error message to tell you about it. So that brings us to sort of the other side of things. Not everything you put in comes back out. So uh, deposits support MathML, uh, which is great. Trust me, this is beautiful MathML. If you don't read MathML, we'll see. Uh, it really is beautiful math, or maths for you UK-ish people. Um, so we render it beautifully on our platform. Uh, but then we start getting complaints from users that, hey, you know, we messed up their titles. Because they go to Crossref or another service, and hey, where'd the math go? It's gone. Uh, this has been an open ticket of ours for about two years. MathML deposits have been supported, I think, three or four years, if I go back. Uh, they don't make it out the other side, though. 
Uh, as you can see in the, the JSON API, the, the math just disappears. So, you know, that, that seems like a minor problem, except the vast majority of our articles have math in them. So users are justifiably uh, sort of sensitive to that. And really, it, it's kind of an indication of where Crossref, for, for better or worse, really is the center of this ecosystem. But people who are end users don't really know that, right? So we get the complaint that, hey, my data looks wrong in Kudos or Impact Story or some other tool or some bibliographic tool. And we go, hey, well, you know, we published it correctly. What happened? We traced it down, and it was actually something we put into Crossref. Uh, and then, really, our, our responsibility kind of ends there. There's nothing we can really do about it. Uh, we get blamed by the author, but we did the best possible thing we could in that case. Uh, so, you know, that, that becomes a problem, and, and that kind of, you know, shows really Crossref has to take some of this stuff a little bit seriously because, you know, it, it's kind of been really successful on the JSON APIs especially. Uh, people are really using them. And uh, it's not clear where things break down. So, you know, the real problem with on this deposit side is these small consistencies add up. And, you know, the, the cognitive load of, new, of a new person having to implement this is, is tremendous, right? Uh, I, I can't even imagine having to start from scratch and trying to implement Crossref deposits for some set of content. It's, it's very painful. Um, as far as I know, there's no plan to sort of rationalize that or, or provide a, you know, real path forward. Uh, with, with Patricia having this new role, I'm hoping that's uh, something that could be done. Uh, but, you know, it, it's a complicated thing, and, and there's no real, you know, hope on the horizon for, for most immediate things. Uh, we didn't even get to some of the harder stuff, but let's move on from there. So let's talk about APIs, because uh, we have to get the metadata back out somewhere, right? Got the data in, got to get it out. Uh, the REST API. The REST API has been a fantastic development, I'll say. And when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about the new JSON REST API, you know, API.crossref. Uh, as far as I know. So, you know, this was the thing that started all these other services out there using Crossref data, because even in a one-line script, you can take in Crossref data. Fantastically successful, great step forward. It's not totally problem-free. We don't have to go through, you know, all of this, but, but point being, it, it's REST, but it's not really RESTy. You get back these weird codes. All the names are sort of with dashes, which is great. I'm a closure guy. We love this sort of naming. But is it what JSON people expect? You know, how does it compare with other JSON APIs? What was the input from the community on, on how the API structure should look? Um, and how does any of this relate to the XML I deposited, right? Because I didn't deposit anything that says, you know, reference count or any of the other fields. You know, what's the translation there between that XML deposit and the JSON API response? Uh, Sometimes there are weird errors. Uh, this one came through uh, an open source tool, Manubot, which uh, started blowing up when the date parts were null. Uh, is it a publisher error? Is it an API error? Is it another error? Uh, they don't know. We don't know. So, you know, it poses a problem. The bibliographic thing blows up. They patched around it because they didn't know where the data was coming from. So they didn't know to contact Crossref. So, you know, I had to kind of tell them that was the right path. Uh, this is a big one for us. Uh, the cited by. So, you know, saying when one article cites another article, it was one of uh, Crossref's first big services, and I'd say really big wins. I mean, this was a huge step forward as well. Uh, authors obsess over this. So we really need it to be fast and, and really accurate. Um, you know, you get new citing articles all the time as other articles cite your, your article and they get published. Uh, corrections, you know, happen at some point and they disappear. So, so how do we get them, right? Uh, our first attempt was uh, XML over email. So I call that the web version of carrier pigeons. Uh, we went you know, days without seeing any matches, got flooded with matches, and some of the emails are just broken. For some reason, there's this weird encoding thing, they just break. That's fine. We'll, we'll just switch to REST API. Crossref has a perfectly good, you know, get forward links API for this. Um, just starts timing out. You know, large amounts of data don't get returned. We play with different date ranges. Some stuff comes, some stuff doesn't. Not clear to us what actually is needed to make that work. So we open a ticket. No problem. There's another API. We move over to OAIPMH, uh, you know, another sort of legacy publishing protocol. Uh, that works for a little bit, gets us past things. We start seeing more timeouts. We still can't get our data. Uh, the whole point of this is we want to have, you know, a complete as, as copy as possible of our citing articles. We can show authors and do internal analytics. Uh, we experiment with some date ranges. No luck. We open a ticket, work with Crossref. They give us, you know, some magic incantations of parameters to work. And awesome, we have data. But, but it takes, you know, quite a bit of work to get to that point. Um, so 
the data we have, though, is citing pairs of articles. Uh, no one is really interested in seeing that. Authors don't like to see a giant page of DOIs, right? Uh, they want to see titles, dates, authors, other stuff about the articles. So we have to get the metadata for those DOI pairs. Um, that's fine. You know, there's, again, there's this awesome REST API for doing that. But there's about 2.5 million articles we need to fetch that for. So that's going to take a long time. Uh, then how often should we refresh that? How do we know when articles that are in there change? How do they get new metadata? No idea. Your guess is as good as mine. Uh, we refresh them on sort of random intervals. So sometimes things don't really suck, and Crossref does really awesome things for us, right? Uh, funder tagging is a great example, uh, because sometimes production vendors suck too. And they miss a DOI for a funder, no problem. Crossref adds it. Uh, as you can see, Crossref, the DOI is asserted by Crossref. They've added this from the open funder registry. That's fantastic. They're, they're adding funders that we, we missed. It's great. Um, no idea they did this for us. Uh, how great is it if we don't know it's there? Uh, how often is it done? Not really sure. Uh, does it change when the new registries come out or the new matches? No idea. So again, we've got to refetch all the metadata through the API for all of our articles to see if that's the case. Uh, we have about 637,000 articles, so that's going to take a while. Oh, but oh, good news is we only have to do this since we started participating in funder uh, tagging, so it's only about 75,000 articles. So it'd be great to get notified about this. Can we? I don't know. The docs don't really mention it. So, you know, even the awesome things, if you don't know that they're there, don't really, you know, help you that much. So that's great. So what I've talked about are sort of the legacy APIs and some of the problems with that. But, you know, there, there's hope on their way, right? There's great new APIs that'll save us all, right? We've got this great new one that Jennifer was showing today about event data. So when I saw event data, I was just, this was fantastic, right? Great documentation. I mean, lots of APIs really should copy their documentation. They talk about not just the API, uh, the data model. They even show graph models of it and how to go through all this stuff. Uh, the conceptual model is all there. It, it's fantastic, really well thought out, great thing. So I looked at that and said, this is great. It's going to solve all of our problems because when I think about it, uh, I think deposit success or failure is an event. Uh, when references are matched, it's an event. Uh, certainly citing articles are, are events. This has got to help us. This will replace everything we complain about. Nope, none of that data is in Crossref event data. Uh, it's yet a new, another new API with a new model, with a new set of data and models and guarantees uh, for us to implement to get you know, other new, really valuable, interesting data. But now it's separated. If it's a data citation, it's going to come through the event data. If it's an article citation, it's going to come through the other article stuff, which I can't even fully refresh. So now I have another service I have to integrate with. It didn't really solve any of the pain. Um, maybe you guys can make this work someday. That would be great. So the real, the real question is, you know, how do we make new equal better, right? So event data was new. A lot of the initiatives that the deposit schema was created or sort of added to to, to address are new things. They're great new things. They're relationships. Uh, there's licenses. There's funding. There's all that. But we you know without a plan to sort of rationalize these things and have a clear vision for how they're evolving in a coherent way each change becomes something that just fractures the existing systems, uh, as we see. So we end up with, you know, all this inconsistency and confusion about where things are. And the only reason a lot of us make sense of this is because we've just been through all these iterations and we kind of think about it. Uh, if you look from sort of a fresh set of eyes, it's not clear why this stuff is there. So in my view, it's time to look at these core systems and see if we can just replace them with the new things or evolve them into something better. Uh, and as Kristen was saying, you know, yesterday in, in, in her keynote, uh, really, we love to think in XML and JSON as sort of a publishing industry. Can we think beyond that, though? The web is more than that. The things we're talking about are much more than that. There are relationship data. There's data sets. Uh, does it make sense to shove this all into XML or legacy formats? Uh, can we have new APIs? You know, Graph, GraphQL is one option there. Uh, but, but, you know, how do we evolve all of this towards something better? So, you know, my, my one immediate suggestion is sort of, uh, the concept of dog fooding, if you're not familiar, is uh, when companies use their own products or use their own software, so a software company using their own software, right? Uh, so one way to solve a lot of this is if you build Crossref with Crossref, right? So if the search, deposits, dashboards, tools are all built on Crossref APIs, uh, you, you very quickly will see that, hey, the stuff you put in over here doesn't really come out here, comes out in an odd way, or, you know, why do I have to track all this stuff just to figure this out? So, you know, I think one thing is if Crossref became their own customer <laughs> for their APIs, uh, that would really, you know, solve that as a problem. 
uh, you know, embracing that API first principle too of everything has to be in the API to be used and you, you have a way to make sure it flows end to end. Uh, Twitter has done it this way. Twitter uses their own APIs to build all their own services. Uh, certainly many other places do that. And, and it's really sort of a guarantee that things do flow end to end. Uh, the real you know, management piece that that logically leads you to is that really the APIs are the product, right? A the APIs are not some extra thing that's added on. APIs are core to what Crossref is. Uh, or they can decide not to be, but, <laughs> but as of now they are because that's what everybody is seeing who is a Crossref customer. I mean, most of us are, are dealing with Crossref at the API layer. Um, you know, members are the customers, and you know, it's important that we have uh, some way to look at that that way. Uh, but the consumers of the APIs, like I said, kudos, you know, Impact Story, a bunch of others out there, all these bibliographic tools are also consumers of the APIs. Uh, so what's, what's their guarantees around the APIs? Uh, how do they get input into whether those tools are having their needs met or not? Uh, you know, that, that's really something that should be considered because it's how, you know, our, us as publishers are driving those services. We're right, making that happen through Crossref. So it's all part of the, the whole ecosystem. Uh, but when it comes to the APIs, you know, where's the roadmap? Uh, why isn't it public, at least for members? You know, we'll, we'll, uh, there could be great plans for rationalizing all of this. I have no idea. I don't, I'm not sure if any of you <laughs> have an idea. Uh, what's the mechanism for doing proposed changes to the schemas? Uh, the namings change, right? That could be okay, it could be not. But why is it inconsistent? Why are new things being introduced that break things with the old in terms of you know, naming and sort of logical semantics? Uh, what's the opportunity for members to have input on that? Uh, where are the API implementations? Like I said, the API is powerful, but you know, um, there's not a single reference implementation of the API in any programming language that Crossref has published, right? Uh, as far as I know, where is the Ruby clients, Python, you know, JavaScript, whatever? There's some community ones that are wrong. I've sent patches. Other people have sent patches. Uh, where is the machine readable API spec, like the Open API spec or something like that? We're, we're really not doing enough to help other people make use of these great services that Crossref is building. So I just want to sort of end with uh, things that don't suck. Uh, the number one th thing being Crossref staff. I will say e every time, every time I have a problem or I hit something weird, you contact support, you contact development, anyway, somebody does help you. They they care about the problem. They work through it. Uh, but you know that that's that's awesome and it, it works. But it's not sustainable. At some point, we have to fix the systems or hire 50 new support people because it's just inevitable that other people are going to hit these problems that we have. Uh, so that's sort of the thing. Uh, I'd like to send a special thanks to Matt, who's a developer on my team, who deals with this problem, these problems every day. Uh, I wanted to stage a photo of him surrounded, passed out on the floor with Crossref stickers on him and empty beer bottles, but we didn't really have time to do that. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know, uh, take any questions you have. <laughs> it's got to be one. Um, could you describe uh, your API and how it's like Plus Jerry. Now I'm going to change the question. Um, now, um, can you describe uh, your APIs and how they're used and um, and where you know and where you see them going in the future? And do you have a public roadmap of what they're going to? Be? Yeah, our public or internal APIs, I guess, are two sort of different stories there. Um, so we do provide a, a public, open, free API. So if you go to harvest.aps.org, I can toss the link up. That, that's our public REST API. Um, it is a pretty traditional JSON REST API. Uh, we, we do provide, um, we don't really provide a roadmap to it because we're not really enhancing too much of it right now. Uh, but we have two versions of that. There's an open public one. Anybody can use it. Uh, and then there's additional services we have on top of that that require a contract with us to provide other metadata. Uh, but that has a full JSON schema that's documented, that's machine readable. We do provide reference implementations of the API to customers who ask for it uh, in, I think, Ruby and JavaScript at this point, um, possibly others. Uh, so, you know, it's there and we're using it. Longer term, well, not longer term, but near term, uh, we are looking at uh, replacing all of this stuff with GraphQL, which I mentioned. We're, we're making heavy use of that on some internal systems right now. And um, if you're not familiar, GraphQL is a, a technology that came out of Facebook. It basically treats data like a, like a graph instead of just data. Uh, and you can specify the data that you want from it, so it forces you to tell it what data to fetch. Uh, that solves a number of problems, but, but one of them being it's machine readable in terms of the API specification, and you only get back the data you ask for, and you can traverse linkages and other fun things with that. Uh, but that, that solves a lot of other issues, so we're making pretty heavy use of that. 
Other questions? Chris. Hey, Paul. Um, Chris. Thanks. Good talk. Do you have any examples of organizations who are doing this well that Crossref could look to as kind of examples of best practice? Yeah, so I mean, the number one thing to look at is don't look at scholarly publishing. Scholarly publishing is terrible uh, <laughs> as an industry. I, I mean, I say that with you know all the love of being in the industry, but really, when you want to look at what's really pushing technology and and doing API stuff well, it's all coming from the business to business and consumer space. And, and like I said, GraphQL and you know Open API and other specs and stuff uh, come from other places. If you look at the developer portals for for anybody, right? For for Twitter, uh, for Facebook, for anybody, you, you've got. Uh, clear milestones and roadmaps, you've got machine readable reference API implementations, you've got code samples, you've got all of that. You've got API governance models for a lot of these things. Uh, there are a lot of companies that sell APIs as services. Uh, there are API brokerages. There's a rich ecosystem out there. Um, none of them are doing XML, <laughs> XSD over, over HTTP like kind of things. Uh, most of their APIs look different than, than what we have in the scholarly publishing industry and that's because you know, they've all moved way past that or tried that and, 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 and gone way past that. So I'd look at the consumer and industry space and see what's going on there. I mean, if you look at um, a great example is Stripe, the payments API. You can get up and running using Stripe in a matter of seconds and taking payments with, with just a couple API calls. Uh, you can do that with Crossref's JSON API for sure. You definitely can't get stuff flowing through the deposit API, tracking deposits back out, doing all that that way, right? So something like that is a model. And if you go to their page, there's click this link to copy some code and you're done. Uh, you know, that, that's sort of the customer experience I think Crossref should be striving for. And, and others in this space. Crossref is not the worst in the industry <laughs> by far. Um, but, but definitely th th there needs to be a plan here for, for kind of bringing it up to consumer level quality. Other questions? All right. Thank you, Paul. Cool. Sure. <laughs>